Okay, hi everyone. We're going to go over questions that were submitted regarding Hashimoto's. So here's the first question. In the world of functional medicine, what would be an optimum TSH level for a 65-year-old woman with Hashimoto's? Well, this is a topic of ongoing debate even within conventional uh, endocrine uh, communities. So thyroid stimulating hormone is the laboratory marker that's used to diagnose Hashimoto's. And, you know, when you look at the guidelines and standards for TSH levels, there's uh, symposiums, there's conferences between different organizations at different times. And, you know, for example, the Endocrine Society, or um, you look at uh, different endocrine specialty groups with the World Health Organization, you look at uh, the American Academy of uh, uh, Physicians, they, they all have different ranges that they may use. And then laboratories themselves have different ranges. So first of all, you should know that there isn't a consensus of all the different thyroid endocrinology researchers and endocrinologists of what should be the appropriate level of TSH. However, one thing is really clear over the past 20 years, the numbers keep going down. <laughs> so what they thought was uh, a level for hypothyroidism 20 years ago, like TSH levels of seven and above were considered to be hypothyroidism. Now, most labs will have TSH levels in the 4.5 or 5 range, and most of these um, expert endocrine societies will have ranges of TSH above 4 or 5, really being levels uh, that are clearly hypothyroidism. And what we mean by hypothyroidism is that the thyroid gland has had enough tissue destruction that they need they need to be on replacement, that it's it's gone to the point where they're not able to make enough thyroid hormones to meet their body's metabolic demands. So, you know, that's one thing that's happening in conventional circles. So what about functional circles? Well, in functional circles, you have opinions all over the place, and then these are different opinions, right? So, uh, and it depends on what country. So I'm just, I'm going to refer to the U.S. US ranges. But typically, TSH ranges, you know, anything above 3.5, you start to get suspicious that they may be in a hypothyroid state. But for 4.5 and above, especially at above 5, you definitely have will have most experts agree, uh, most conventional endocrinologists agree that that's, that's the range for hypothyroidism. So in the functional communities, functional range communities, functional medicine, uh, we're looking at sub, looking at optimal levels. You'll see everything from anything above 2.5 is an issue. I think the average would be around 3. I think 3 is a little too extreme. 3.5 to 4 would be like a suboptimal level of activity, but anything about 4, 4.5, 5 is clearly uh, hypothyroidism. Okay, next question. <clears throat> I have Hashimoto's and lots of food sensitivities. I follow the autoimmune paleo diet with introductions and feel so much better overall. My question is this, I still have some foods I can't tolerate. Does this mean I still have a leaky gut? Or do some people just have food intolerances for the rest of their life? Okay, well, let's go over a couple things here that's really important for everyone to know. So if you have Hashimoto's, then that means you have an autoimmune disease. And if you have an autoimmune disease, that actually means you have lost what's called immune tolerance. And immune tolerance is your body's ability to not attack itself and not react to food proteins or environmental triggers to some degree, right? So uh, we don't normally react to every single food we eat. And, that, and if we start to react to lots of different food proteins, that's that's what's called loss of tolerance. We don't normally attack our own immune system. Uh, I mean, our own. we don't normally attack our own tissues with our immune system. And when that happens, that's autoimmunity. So the fact that someone has their immune system attack their own thyroid gland being Hashimoto's, there's some degree of loss of tolerance. And one of the things you have to know is that most food sensitivities that are developed aren't just due to leaky gut. They're actually due to something called immune tolerance. And leaky gut is one part of immune tolerance. So you have to have your tight junctions of your gut like put together and healthy. So uh, you don't allow absorption of proteins that are undigested. Because if you have proteins that, if you have undigested proteins that can get through a leaky gut, then those those proteins can then trigger the immune response because you're, and cells underneath your gut barrier, like your T cells and gut uh, gut mass cells and macrophages and those types of cells, as soon as they see a large protein cross, they will think it's a foreign invader. That shouldn't be there. Only small particle amino acids should cross the intestinal lining 
because they're properly broken down by digestive enzymes. And they eventually break down to small enough molecular weight where they can then cross through the intestinal lining. But if there's holes, then that can be a factor. And this is why there's that association with people having leaky gut um, or intestinal permeability and then developing food sensitivities. But it's not the only mechanism. Um, so when you have loss of tolerance, you can have what are called overactive dendritic cells that can cause the same thing, even with an intact gut barrier. So dendritic cells are immune cells on top of the gut barrier and they sample proteins. Things like vitamin D deficiencies, vitamin A deficiencies, uh, chronic active in, uh, immune responses from infections can make these dendritic cells really, really active. So that can make a person still have reactions to many food proteins, even though they don't have leaky gut. Uh, you can have regulatory T cell dysfunctions. So there are T cells that are called regulatory T cells, and they balance out the immune system response to a trigger. So some people have triggers from all food proteins they get exposed to, even if they don't have gut barriers because their T cells are dysregulating. Um, there's even a relationship between the gut and the liver called Cooper cells, and they can be upregulated by uh, haptonegic, they call haptin activation, by chemical activation. And they communicate with the dendritic cells in the gut. And you can have reactions that take place in this gut-liver axis that may have an impact on immune tolerance. But it's actually a very detailed concept. And I think it's one of those things that most people and experts, even in the you know alternative medicine, dietary, nutrition world, don't really understand. Uh, and if you want to learn more about it, We've, I've written lots of articles about it. Uh, you can go to Dr. K News, D-R-K-N-E-W-S, and I break down the research into simple things that are easy to understand about what, what's immune tolerance. And leaky gut is only one of the things that can cause multiple food intolerances. We also have a program called uh, uh, Food Sensitivity that we get into these more, and we also have another program on Hashimoto's, and even a specific program on oral tolerance. And if you go to Dr. K News, these programs are online. They come with work workbooks and videos, and they help you go through it and learn how to improve your own tolerance. So to answer your question, you have, you know, the question being, I have Hashimoto's and lots of food sensitivities. I follow the autoimmune paleo diet with, with introductions and feel so much better. My question is, do I still do I still have some foods I can tolerate? Does this mean I still have leaky gut? So no, it doesn't mean you still have leaky gut. It means you've lost immune tolerance and you may have to do other things besides leaky gut to stop reacting to as many foods. And the second part of the question is, are or do some people just have food intolerances for the rest of their life? So most autoimmune, most patients suffering from autoimmune diseases will have food intolerances for the rest of their life to some degree. And as their autoimmune disease gets flared up and they get further immune tolerance dysregulation, maybe they had a stressful event, maybe they had exposure to food and lack of sleep at a stressful event all at the same time, they can have their immune tolerance sway in a situation where they start to react against foods more than they had like last month. And as their immune system calms down, their immune tolerance starts to normalize again, they could start to have less reactions. But it's an ongoing battle for people that have uh, food, that, that have uh, autoimmunity. Now, what's not real is this world of like, I'm going to fix my leaky gut and I should be able to eat everything I want. And that doesn't work for people that have autoimmunity. That can work for people that, for example, were on antibiotics for a period of time, had a leaky gut develop from antibiotics and they fixed their gut barrier. And now they don't have reactions to foods they were having after that event. So that, that happens in people that don't have autoimmune disease. But with people that actually have autoimmune disease, you're not gonna just basically <laughs> Uh, fixed leaky gut, and then forever you're good and uh, you don't have to worry about foods anymore. For people that have autoimmune disease, every time your immune system flares up, and it may not even be something you ate. It could be from a stressful event. It could be from um, uh, lack of sleep. It could be from overtraining. It could be whatever that triggers your immune system. Every time you trigger your inflammatory immune response, you're going to break down your intestinal tight junctions to some degree. So... It's an ongoing battle with keeping that gut bearer in, in, in check. It's an ongoing battle to support immune tolerance and, and to reduce the activation of your immune system to your own body, to the environmental triggers, and to foods. So if you have autoimmunity, you would suspect to have cr uh, chronic ongoing issues with food intolerances 
Um, and you'll have to follow a diet that's not as triggering like an autoimmune paleo diet and constantly support leaky gut off and on and even constantly support immune tolerance to have the best outcome. That's that's real. That's what most people that manage their autoimmune get into remission understand. And those are important concepts. Okay, next question. I have many symptoms such as low body temp, dry skin, fatigue, insomnia, brain fog, etc., but no diagnosis of Hashimoto's at this time. How do I know if I really have it? Well, I mean, the symptoms you have, like low body temperature, dry skin, fatigue, insomnia, brain fog, they, they can be symptoms for many different things, and they can be symptoms even unrelated to diseases. They could just be from systemic inflammation. Uh, you could have uh, overall... L l lack of antioxidant production in your body, diet that's too inflammatory, exposure to environmental chemicals that are too inflammatory that kind of puts you in that state. You could uh, not be absorbing things. You can have uh, hormonal issues like estrogen, progesterone. You could have subtle blood sugar issues. You have a combination of many functional imbalances that, that cause the symptoms you're explaining about. But if you really want to know if you have Hashimoto's or not, the the gold standard diagnostic test is to run the antibodies. The two antibodies you want to make sure you have done are TPO antibodies. TPO stands for thyroid perioxidase. And the other one is thyroglobulin antibodies, also known as TG antibodies. So you want to check both of them. Now, studies show the majority of people that have Hashimoto's will show up with TPO antibodies, but not always thyroglobulin antibodies. However, there are some that only will show up with thyroglobulin antibodies and not with TPO. And there are also many that will show up for both thyroglobulin and TPO antibodies. But the point is, if you're trying to screen to see if you have Hashimoto's, you need to run your antibodies. Now, if your antibodies are negative, um, you may want to run them again because sometimes they fluctuate. There's also a small percentage of people that have no elevations of antibodies, but when they do biopsy of their thyroid gland, they actually see that they have Hashimoto's. And that's another small percentage of people. So it's around two to 5% of Hashimoto's patients. So it's possible that you don't have the diagnosis. It's possible that your antibodies are fluctuating. If you only tested once, you should check them again. And it's possible you're in that, you know, two to 5% of people with Hashimoto's that will only have the diagnosis confirmed with biopsy, and you just don't have levels of antibodies in your bloodstream that are showing those reactions. So those are all the key things there. Okay, next question. Can you do Cyrex Ray 5 if you are on immune suppressants? Also, what tests do you do for TH, T helper and NFKB levels? Okay, so let's talk about this first question here. So can you do Cyrex Ray 5 if you have an immune suppression? So all Cyrex Ray 5 are antibody measurements. So this question really applies to, can you measure antibodies? And antibodies are used to check for autoimmunity against your own tissues. So you have tissue antibodies like TPO, thyroglobin we talked about. You can have antibodies to your nervous system tissue, so myelin antibodies. But, but antibodies are markers for uh, B cells making these proteins that then attach to your tissue, which then signals your immune system to destroy them. Antibodies are what's used to measure food sensitivities and food allergies. They check um, antibodies to a whole series of vegetables, plants, and foods, and they can be done with different immunoglobulins, or IgG, or IgG, or IgM. These are all the world of antibodies. So when you're looking for antibodies, you're looking to see if your immune system is creating proteins to destroy something that they think is foreign or reactive, right? And that can happen to food foods when people develop food sensitivity and allergies, and that can happen to tissues with autoimmunity. So the question is really, can you do antibody testing if you're on immune suppressants? And the answer is maybe, but it depends on a few things. So some people that have autoimmunity will be on immune suppressants. It could be first line therapy is usually like corticosteroids, and then if their autoimmunity is much worse, they can be able to call biologic drugs where they specifically suppress parts of the immune system. But if you have autoimmunity and you're on an immune suppressing drug, the way you can tell if you can get accurate antibody levels is to have a test done called total immunoglobulin. And immunoglobulin is another name for antibody. And it's really not an expensive test. Uh, it's usually around $40, $50 um, if you're just paying cash for it. And what they'll do is just measure if you if you have antibodies. And 
if you are getting, for example, uh, antibodies checked with IgG, which is one of the antibodies, you look at your total IgG levels on this immunoglobulin profile. And if you're able to make antibodies and your total immunoglobulin count is normal, then even though you're an immune suppressant, you should still be able to run an antibody test, something like Cyrex Ray 5 or any other antibody test, and still get accurate results. However, if you're on immune suppressants and you do a total immunoglobulin count, meaning the total amount of antibodies in your body, total immunoglobulin, and that's really depressed from the immune suppressants, then you're going to get a lot of false negatives, and it would really be a waste of your time and energy. Now, immunoglobulin testing is not very expensive. It's, again, $40, $50, something around there to get that test done. When you start measuring antibodies, like a food sensitivity panel, uh, or a Cyrex Ray 5, or just things like myelin basic protein antibodies, those can be several hundred dollars. So in order to avoid that expense, you may just want to run the immunoglobulin count. And if your immunoglobulin count is normal, the, then there's no problem running any of these antibody tests. The next question is, what test do you do for T helper cell activity and FKB? Those are specific immunological tests. And, um, uh, those right you can get those done with any conventional laboratory they're just they're just expensive next question okay lab results indicate chronic inflammatory respiratory syndrome testing was uh, marcones positive functional medicine practitioner wants me to have a neuroquant done any thoughts about this so let me explain a couple things here so there is uh condition that's been labeled chronic inflammatory respiratory syndrome. And for that, for the, to make it very simple, it's just people that become very sensitive to mold and uh, they get mold sensitivity. And for some of these people, when they get a culture of their, of their nasal cavities, they have a streptococcus resistant uh, bacteria. And that's not uncommon for many people that have chronic sinus issues, many people that have sensitivity to, to, to mold. Uh, sensitivities to mold species and then there's a protocol that many practitioners learn uh, called the shoemaker protocol and that protocol everyone gets this neuro quant mri done as as part of the workup and you know in reality do you really need to do that no you know really the only time you should do a neuro quant mri is if there is a reason for you to check your brain volume and your brain function it's, it's a expensive test so when you should do a neuroquant MRI test to measure the volume of your brain is when you start to have symptoms of mild cognitive impairment. Just having sensitivity to mold doesn't mean you should do that test, right? That's its own independent thing. But the problem is when you have practitioners that learn a protocol and they have to do every type of testing, then uh, you get a problem. Like the same group, the shoemaker group will have you look at different colors and if it's off, they diagnose it as a brain issue. I mean, that 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 really is ridiculous. There's some really good things about the Shoemaker protocol that have a lot of evidence, and there's some things that are just uh, out there with that much evidence. It's a combination of both. At, at the end of the day, um, you know, the practitioners everyone sees may be influenced by how they were trained, and some people that get trained in the mold world by the Shoemaker protocol will recommend that NeuroQuant MRI to, to everyone, even though it may not be necessary. Next question. Why would I have serum high TPO antibodies, TSH 3.5, and hyperthyroid symptoms? Shouldn't I have hypothyroid symptoms? I'm finding the whole situation very confusing. <laughs> okay, well, it basically looks like what the, what the patient is saying with their lab test, high TPO antibodies, which means they have autoimmunity against the thyroid gland, and their TSH is 3.5, which is actually for most labs within the normal reference range, but she's having hyperthyroid symptoms. So you have to understand with Hashimoto's, with hypothyroid, with uh, Hashimoto's response, the autoimmune response is going to have flare-ups. And most people that have Hashimoto's are going to have both low thyroid symptoms called hypothyroid and also elevated thyroid hormone symptoms, which is called hyperthyroid. So... The reason that happens is because when people have Hashimoto's, their thyroid hormones, especially in the early stages, their thyroid hormones are fluctuating, partly because their immune system is attacking their thyroid gland. Uh, 
And every time it attacks the thyroid gland, then the thyroid hormones are released from that injured tissue that go into circulation. If they have a recent flare-up and attack, they can get enough tissue destruction to then cause enough release of hormones from that tissue destruction to their system where they feel hyper. Then they go back to feeling hypo. Then they get another flare-up, tissues are destroyed, hormones get released in the bloodstream, they get back into hyper. So one of the key features clinically of a person that has Hashimoto's is they have both hyper overactive and hypo underactive symptoms. So what are hyperactive and hypoactive symptoms? Well, hyperactive symptoms will be things like anxiety, irritability, insomnia, inward trembling, nervousness, and even tremor shakiness. And then hypothyroid symptoms would be things like constipation, fatigue, uh, mental slowness, slow metabolism, uh, weight gain. And then with people that have Hashimoto's, they'll, they'll go both back and forth between those two symptoms. And and that's part of it. The, 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 the reason that happens is in part due to the fact that they're having these autoimmune flare-ups, these relapse remissions of their immune response. Okay, next question. <clears throat> Can someone have low thyroid and need T4 replacement, but not have Hashimoto's? Yes, you could have low thyroid and, and need thyroid replacement and not have Hashimoto's. The chances are pretty low. Uh, because remember, most of the studies are showing 90%, and some studies, 98% of people that are actually hypothyroid have Hashimoto's as the cause. So what are those like 2% or, you know, 2% or 5% or 10% of people that need thyroid replacement. Those are people that had things like uh, uh, viral infections of the thyroid gland. They got a common cold. The cold infiltrated, the, the virus infiltrated to the thyroid gland. That caused the thyroid gland to get destroyed. That's called a viral thyroiditis. And, and now they've had enough destruction from that infection impacting the thyroid gland. They need to be on replacement, but it's not Hashimoto's. The, there's things that also happen with bacteria, bacterial thyroiditis. It's not as common, but... Some people get bacterial infections that then cause their thyroid gland to get destroyed and to be a replacement. Some people have tumors and they have the part of the thyroid gland gets removed and they need to be on T4. So that that accounts for that other like 2%, 5% of people that go on replacement. The majority of people that go on T4 replacement have Hashimoto's as their cause. Okay. Now, the second part of the question, what if they don't test positive for antibodies? Well, there are some people, like we said earlier, that don't test for antibodies. Um, antibodies do fluctuate, so you may have to test them more than once. And there is some studies that show that about 5% of people have Hashimoto's will only be diagnosed when they get a biopsy done, that they're not going to show the antibody level elevations. And part of the reason is because there could be other target proteins that are being attacked and inflamed in the Hashimoto's process besides the two that are being measured, TPO and thyroglobulin. So when they do a biopsy, they're not looking at TPO and thyroglobin antibodies. They're looking at to see an inflammatory cellular response, expressive autoimmunity, and it's not specific to any kind of autoantibody. So there's there are a subset of people that do actually have Hashimoto's when they do biopsy of their tissue for the characteristic pattern of, of autoimmunity against those tissues but their blood TPO and thyroglobin antibodies aren't there, suggesting that there could be another target protein that's being attacked that's not conventionally available to us in lab tests at this point. Okay, next question. Uh, next part of the question, could they still have Hashimoto's without all the traditional symptoms? Uh, yes. And then there are many people in the really early stages of Hashimoto's that don't have any symptoms yet. And uh, that's called silent autoimmunity. So in the world of autoimmune diseases, there's different stages of autoimmunity, and the very first stage is silent. And that's defined by someone on lab tests that measures autoantibodies on blood tests, but doesn't have any tissue, tissue destruction yet. And what studies have shown over time, they do, 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 do develop symptoms that oh, now these antibodies that, that are measured are now called predictive antibodies. So some studies show, for example, if you start to show um, thyroid antibodies, for sure in your lifespan, you're going to be hypothyroid at some point. Some studies show if you have antibodies to the pancreas, like GAD65 antibodies, within five years, you're going to be di type 1 diabetic. So when these antibodies first show up, they're in the silent stage, but over enough time, they start to <clears throat> then create symptoms. Okay, next question. <clears throat> what do you think 
of thyroid injections when meds are going up and down every month, either not absorbing or absorbing too much. Um, they don't do thyroid injections. <laughs> I mean, that would be crazy. So th you got to understand, thyroid hormones, T4 and T3, are, are going to activate your, your metabolic rate. If someone injected T3 and T4 into your system, like you, you may get arrhythmia. You may, you may end up with like arrhythmia-induced stroke. You may have severe anxiety. I mean, it's not even available. So what do I think of thyroid injections? It's not available. No one does it, and no one is going to. It's going to be way too aggressive. You've got to, you got to take thyroid hormones orally so it can slowly absorb, and you have slower release. So that's the key thing. Now you're saying, what if you're not absorbing it or, absor or, or absorbing too much of it? That's its own issue. Uh, and this could be related to fillers that you may have issues with the thyroid hormones. You may need to take a gel source. So for people that have malabsorption issues and people that have like celiac disease, because lots of Hashimoto's people have celiac disease. And in celiac disease, what happens is gluten totally destroys their um, microvilla. So if you look at the gut, there's these fingers that stick out that absorb nutrients. And in celiac disease, the microvilla basically get digested. An analogy that some people have used is like shag carpet. And if the shag carpet totally wears out, then those those little microvilla, those shaggy parts of the carpet aren't there to absorb nutrients. And that's basically what malabsorption is. So malabsorption is your gut microvilla, these little tight fingers that bind and take in nutrients are destroyed. And there are some people that have Hashimoto's, and especially those that have celiac disease, where they're gut microvilla are totally destroyed and they have malabsorption syndromes. And for those people, what they use is usually a thyroid replacement gel. And the most most mostly used and effective one is something called tyrosent. So for people that have malabsorption syndromes, they do better with tyrosent. So I hope that answers your question. Next question. I would like to know the relationship between Hashimoto's and cholesterol. I do not have hereditary hypercholesterolemia, and my diet is clean, but my cholesterol is extremely high, and my endo says it's due to my Hashimoto's, but can't tell me the reason nor what I can do about it. Okay. So what you have to understand is when you're in a hypothyroid state, this is what's important. If you're in a hypothyroid state, meaning your TSH levels are high because you're not getting enough thyroid hormones in your system. You don't have enough thyroid replacement or your body's not making enough. Your pituitary is pumping out lots of thyroid stomach hormone to make that thyroid gland work. Um, and there just isn't enough T4, T3 thyroid hormones in your system. You can have very high cholesterol levels. And part of the reason is not because your body's making more cholesterol, but thyroid hormones activate the physiological processes that clear cholesterol from the body. So what happens in hypothyroid states is people get really high cholesterol levels. And actually that's one of the indications if a person hasn't been screened for hypothyroidism to check. So if all of a sudden someone's total cholesterol level is 300, 350, 400, and uh, the, you know, they've never had that before, a class uh, conventional approach required approach in the flow chart of things is to, to get them screened to see if they're not hypothyroid. And if they are hypothyroid and they go on thyroid replacement, then that cholesterol level should just come down. So I would only assume from what you're asking here is that your endocrinologist saw your cholesterol was high and you were probably in a hypothyroid state and said, well, just the Hashimoto's. And if, that, if at that point he put you on replacement, then that should be all you need. But what's important to check is on the follow-up test. And on the follow-up test, if your TSH levels are back to normal, meaning you, you have enough thyroid hormones in your system to not cause your pituitary to try to stimulate it by releasing TSH, then if your cholesterol is still high, then it's not Hashimoto's. It's not the hypothyroidism. But on the other hand, if you go on replacement and you do a follow-up test and your cholesterol levels come down, that was probably an accurate diagnosis. So realize that when you don't have enough thyroid hormones in your system, your body can't clear out cholesterol, and that's why those levels are high. Okay, next question. Can using chemicals such as hair color and bleach on oneself and for a living cause issues for Hashimoto's? Well, yes and no. So when you look at chemicals, not everyone has the same reactions to chemicals. So when we get exposed to chemicals, there's a couple things that happens. First of all, we gotta talk about what kind of chemical it is. 
There's some chemicals that are persistent organic pollutants, which stay in our body forever. So things like uh, lead, things like mercury, our body doesn't know how to get rid of them. The so-called heavy metals, those are persistent. And then there are non-persistent chemicals like uh, fire retardants or BPA and plastic or many chemicals that are used in hair coloring and bleach. Those are all non-persistent chemicals. So your body can clear those out. And for those chemicals, if it can clear them out, it depends upon your what are called biotransformation pathways in your liver. So your liver has pathways to clear out chemicals. And we use the slang term detox, but it's basically called the hepatic being liver biotransformation. Biotransformation meaning converting chemicals that are not able to be eliminated from your body into chemicals that can be. So chemicals get converted by the liver to what are called water-soluble metabolites that, that can then be eliminated in urine, feces, and sweat. So if you get exposed to a chemical and your body can clear it out, it's not an issue. If you get exposed to a chemical and your body can't clear it out, then that becomes an issue. And different people have different genes that have some part of their liver biotransformation pathways more or less effective to certain chemicals. And then there's things that happen over time like uh, micronutrient intake and other chemical exposures and, and hormone activity that all activate and turn on these biotransformation pathways. So you could, for example, be depleted in sulfur, like you're just not eating enough foods with high sulfur content anymore. And you're also taking a medication that has these chemicals cleared out by sulfation pathways. So the combination of having lack of sulfur in your diet and drugs that get cleared up by your liver pathway called sulfation, where they add sulfur to the chemical to make it met metabolizable so you can clear it out of your body, those both happen at the same time. And now you get exposed to a chemical or hair color or bleach like you're asking and requires sulfation, then that could be an issue for that person at that time because of those other factors. So, you know, chemicals have different impacts on different people based on their biotransformation integrity at that time when they're exposed. Now, if you can't clear out that chemical and it's in the, you have biotransformation issues with it, so what happens next? Well, what's interesting is what happens next is these chemicals start to bind to your proteins. So if you can't clear it, they bind to proteins. And once they bind to proteins, the chemical structure of the protein changes. And this is called haptination. And what haptination means is there's a protein in your body that your body is not reacting to. Now a chemical attaches to the protein. If it changes the structure of the protein, your immune system now thinks this protein that's normally in your body is foreign, it'll make antibodies against it. So this is a mechanism of drug-induced autoimmunity. This is a mechanism of chemical-induced autoimmunity. So if you can't clear the chemical and those chemicals bind to your proteins, and if your proteins get configured into a point where they trigger the immune response, then those chemicals can absolutely trigger an inflammatory autoimmune response. So that's that's the concept in autoimmunity known as haptination. Um, we did a course uh, on Hashimoto's called Hashimoto Solving the Puzzle. Where we talked about these things, but we even did a course on autoimmunity solving the puzzle that explained these different concepts of how chemicals trigger autoimmunity. If you want to know more about them, definitely go to... Uh, my website, drknews, drknews.com, and uh, uh, you can look for those programs, Autoimmunity Solving the Puzzle and Hashimoto Solving the Puzzle. So, but the key thing to remember is that not everyone with chemicals can have this, has, can have the same reaction. Now, you're asking if you're being exposed to call it like chemicals such as color and bleach on yourself, could that cause a problem for you? Well, it, it might. And here's the thing. The, if these chemicals have lots of free radicals in them, which they all do for bleaching your hair and, and coloring hair, they're going to deplete your antioxidants and they're going to deplete different uh, nutrients that are used for phase one, phase two. And if you don't have healthy antioxidant status and don't have enough healthy micronutrients that are used for these pathways, then constant exposure to those chemicals get to the point where you, you just depleted those, those, those uh, efficiency of those pathways. So you could definitely take, uh, you know, uh, antioxidants to help reduce your risk. You can definitely take things like N-acetylcysteine, a lot of, a lot of sulfur is needed for these pathways to clear out chemicals. Um, and just, the, just a simple 
you know, micronutrient supplement may not be a bad idea just to make sure you have healthy nutritional status if you're being exposed to chemicals all the time. Okay, next question. <clears throat> Can all of this material be used on someone who has had a complete thyroidectomy? Okay, so I think what they're asking is, all the material is the information we teach at Hashimoto Solving the Puzzle. So the answer is not, not necessarily. So the question is, why do you have a thyroidectomy? If you had a thyroidectomy because they thought that you had a mass or tumor, that's not really Hashimoto's. And the applications we talk about Hashimoto's don't apply. Let's go on to the next question. Okay, here's a question. Please share if there are ways to heal a nodule. <clears throat> so we're, we're assuming it's a thyroid nodule. Is it basically falling through your guidance in the course? What are your thoughts on iodine supplementation? Any recommendations on how to heal the nodule? <laughs> so we go from nodule to iodine supplementation back to nodule. All right, so let's talk about the nodule first. <clears throat> well, you have to understand that thyroid nodules are really common and they're benign. So all a nodule is is just a hollow growth of tissue. And statistics show as you get older and older, you start to develop nodules more frequently. So one study made it really clear and they showed that 40% of 40 year old individuals have at least a thyroid nodule. And then 50% of 50 year olds have at least a thyroid nodule. And then 60% of all 60 year olds have at least a thyroid nodule. So as you get older, you're just going to make some nodules. As you get older, we all have things happen to us. And one of the things that happens to us besides our skin being less elastic and we don't have as much muscle mass and our bone density goes down is we start to have nodules develop and they're benign uh, for the most part. Now, every time, anytime you have a single isolated nodule, uh, you know, your, your doctor should go through and do a biopsy and make sure that it's not cancerous. But as far as treatments, there is no treatment for nodules. They're going to happen, uh, and they're not a concern of any, any, of any of any type. So if it's a benign, no, a benign nodule, then there are no concerns. If it's malignant, then they need to remove the nodule. So I hope that answers your question. So nothing do, nutritional dietary is going to matter or, e, or even have an impact on nodules. Now, the question is about iodine. So what are your thoughts on iodine? First of all, iodine is not going to get rid of your nodule. <laughs> so let's, let's make sure that's not misunderstood. Iodine is, if you have Hashimoto, it's going to be a trigger. Um, I think we did a whole podcast on that. So I think what you're asking is, can you use iodine and will that have an impact on the nodule? And the answer is no. And iodine may actually flare up Hashimoto's because iodine activates the TPO autoimmune response. Okay, next question. I have an elongated uvula and the sides and back of my throat are red and swollen. Is it possible that these are sensitive Hashimoto's? I had a sleep study and sleep apnea was ruled out. You know, this is where it's not a direct symptom of Hashimoto's. So having an, an like inflamed uvula uh, is really more of an indication of a, an active infection of some kind. So if they're red and swollen, I would also assume your tonsils are red and swollen. I mean, you may, this is the kind of stuff like go to see an eyes, ears, throat, nodes specialist, right? Like, don't blame everything in Hashimoto's and don't think you're going to supplement out of everything just because you support Hashimoto's. Uh, you just may have an, you know, inflamed, swollen uh, throat. It could be strep, it could be staph, it could be other kind of infection. You need to get that cultured. You need to get evaluated. So it's not a common symptom of Hashimoto's. Okay. Thank you for submitting those questions. And, and uh, I hope that was useful to you. And thank you again.